Hello, my name is Marianne Neary. I'm Associate Law Librarian at Boston College Law School, and I'm so pleased today that I have the chance to talk to Kent Greenfield, Professor of Law and Law Fund Research Scholar, about his new book. It's titled The Myth of Choice. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, thank you Marianne. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about the book. Wonderful. Tell us, what motivated you to write a book dedicated to the issue of choice? So the, the, the book is about the concept of choice throughout law, politics, culture, religion. And I wrote it because the more I started poking and prodding around this concept, the more I understood that I didn't understand anything about it. Um, a few years ago, I was a head of a group of law schools uh, that sued Donald Rumsfeld um, over an issue that we thought uh, was a constitutional issue. Uh, the military was forcing law schools to uh, accept military recruiters onto campuses. Uh, and if we refused, they would take away all federal funds from, all from, from the entire university. Right, I remember that controversy. Yeah, and, and actually what it turned on was whether we were being coerced. Mm -hmm. And as I traveled the country talking about the, the lawsuit to people, the number one question that people asked me was, you're not being forced to do this. If you don't want military recruiters on your campus, mm -hmm then don't take the money. Now we thought it was a matter of principle because the military recruiters at the time, no longer, but at the time were discriminating against our gay and lesbian students. And we forced every other, we asked every other uh, employer to sign a pledge they wouldn't discriminate and the military mm -hmm. refused. So we took it to court and we said, look, this is a coerced speech. This is a violation of our First Amendment rights. And it got all the way to the Supreme Court. And the question that Chief Justice John Roberts asked our attorney was, you're not being forced, why don't you just not take the money? And we lost, unanimously. <laughs> so, licking my wounds, I came mm -hmm. back and started thinking about really what does it mean to be forced to do something? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have a choice? And then I started realizing that this concept of choice is everywhere in the law. And most of my research and writing is in business law and economics and the like. And I realized it was there too. You know, the the yes. core concept of economics is people can freely choose to buy or sell, and and economics works, or the free market works, the so-called free market works, because people are acting freely. So so then I started to think back, really over the arc of my life, and I grew up in a small town in Kentucky where my father was a Baptist minister, pretty conservative family, pretty conservative town. Um, and the Baptists believe that people uh, get to heaven when they choose Jesus. I see. So even in our religion, the core concept of choice is there. And I remember, once I started thinking about choice, I remember being befuddled by it as a kid because on the one hand, God knows everything and God knows whether you're going to choose to accept him or not. Um, but at the same time, you're supposed to have the choice. So I, I was always confused. Well, if God already knows what you're going to do, does that mean you have free will or not? So really what, I, what it boiled down to is that choice was everywhere I looked. And I knew that I didn't understand it. So I wanted to, and I started researching it. And my thoughts and research really have come out in, in the form of this book. It's a fascinating book. I've really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. I know that you delve into an area of brain science in particular to help explain how consumers make certain choices. And I was a little shocked to read that a brain scan can actually predict whether or not I will make a choice to purchase something depending on what area of my brain is active. Right. Can you explain that? It's fascinating, right? And for those of us who aren't neuroscientists, the more we read about it, we it's fascinating to me, right. and it sounds like it was to you. So the study that you're talking about is that they, they put people in a, 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 in a, a, a functional uh, MRI, which scans your brain mm -hmm. uh, dynamically as you make decisions. And they would show uh, uh, photographs of items and then show the price. And based on whether the, um, the, the part of the brain that shows pleasure mm -hmm lit up more when they showed the item as opposed to the part of the brain that shows pain or that deals with pain lit up more when they showed the price. They could predict whether someone was going to buy the item before the person actually even knew themselves whether they were going uh. to buy it. So they could predict 
uh, they can, uh, so someone, if you're in a, in a in one of these fMRIs, you, uh, they will be able to tell you what you're going to decide before you actually decide. Um, and and as it turns out, you know, the people who know our brain science better than anybody else are the people who are trying to sell us stuff. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the, there are tons of books out there that that talk about this. And and the um, the mistake, it's not really necessarily mistakes. It's the uh, the tendencies that we have are pretty well known. One example is the so-called framing effect. Uh, so every time you go into a to a store and it says uh, the item was ten dollars, now seven fifty, you think, oh, okay, that's a bargain. It's twenty five percent off. But that's only because it's framed in terms of what it used to be. And so they know th that your brain uses that as a frame for the cheaper price, uh, right. and it seems cheap. They also do this with the positioning of items in a store. If they, for example, if, if they want to sell a, a $500 suit, it's much easier to sell a $500 suit if you put a $1,000 suit next to it. Because then it looks like, oh, the $500 suit is cheap or it's inexpensive. Yes. And it right. offers a good deal. Now, if you put a $500 suit next to a $300 suit, it's going to look to be expensive. Right. So there are all these uh, uh, funny examples uh, where the, the one that comes to mind is uh, a catalog, you know, one of these fancy, I think it was a Williams Sonoma catalog. Mm -hmm. They're trying to sell uh, bread makers. You know, the, remember the oh, fad yes. when everybody would buy those yes. bread makers? Um, and it was a $250 bread maker. And they couldn't, they couldn't sell them at all. But the next, the next catalog they sent out, they put next to the $250 bread maker, they put a $400 bread maker. The oh, sales okay. of, the four, of the $250 bread maker went, went up because uh, everybody thought that it was... It was the comparison. It was the comparison. Right. It was the moderate choice. They can forgive themselves mm -hmm. for, for buying that because they didn't take the $400, $400. choice. The, so to boil this down, though, is to say that... Uh, our willpower, our will, our free will, our decision making, our choice is really a battleground. And unless we're, we know that there's a battle going on, mm -hmm. and unless we're girded for battle, we're e really easily manipulated. Yes, and I can see that as you talking, remembering my own consumer choices, I'm sure it plays out across the market. I, one of the fun things about writing this book was I, I was able to remember all kinds of instances in which I made those mistakes too. I, I write about a story about uh, when my wife and I tried to go buy a vacuum cleaner. Yes. And the, we went to our local Best Buy and there must have been 50 different vacuum cleaners to, to choose among. And one of the things we know about human beings is they're really easily overwhelmed by uh, the abundance of choice. Mm -hmm. And it took us an hour. She was basically willing to uh, to walk out of the store and give up and I said no look we got to make a choice and we picked we, we picked a vacuum cleaner which I ended up taking back the next week oh. uh, so and, and as it turns out a neuroscientist would not be surprised at that at all because humans get overwhelmed by choice and the more decisions we have to make the uh, the less willpower we have and the less um, uh, well we make choices so oftentimes after we're, we're sitting there trying to choose among vacuum cleaners or paint colors for your home or, or, uh, or, or, or new ties, usually what people do is throw up their hands and go, okay, close your eyes and pick one. Right. Now, the, the reason why this is important to us as mm -hmm. lawyers and public policy makers is that we know people tend to make bad decisions in certain contexts. So we might want to adjust our public policy uh, in recognition of that. One quick example. We know that people are easily overwhelmed by, by choices that they, they are unfamiliar with. So when asked to make a choice, for example, about um, retirement plans, the more choices you give people, the more likely they are to not choose a retirement plan, which is the worst possible right. option, right? right? People are, option. Ha, ha, right. The worst thing you can do is not save at all. Right. Uh, so it's actually better to give people fewer choices. Mm -hmm. uh, now the key then is wh who chooses the choices that you give people, but it's actually better if people are given three choices rather than 20. They can choose among three. They, it's almost impossible to choose among 20. Now that's, 
that's an interesting issue. I've never really thought about the number of choices it takes to really stump someone. Uh, there's, and it's pretty easy, and I think it's pretty low. Mm -hmm. the, I think probably the most famous experiment mm -hmm. on this is uh, Sheena Iyengar's study about jams in grocery stores. So uh, one grocery store provide, uh, set out a table where you go in and taste the jam. Yes. And they gave, I can't remember the exact number, but uh, a couple dozen choices of jam. And what they learned was that people couldn't really choose among them. And a week later, if you asked people who actually bought jam whether they were happy with their choice, mm -hmm. the people who, uh, who chose among those di all those choices were unhappy with their choice. Because they thought, oh, you know, they, they regret it. They yes. thought that, well, maybe the boysenberry would have been better. So then they did the experiment and offered only three choices of, of jam. More people bought jam, and more people were happy with them. Ah. So if, uh, if, someone, if you're actually running a store or running uh, uh, a, a service industry or trying to provide for your customers, it's actually mm -hmm. better if you give them fewer choices because they'll be happier, they'll be able to make them, and they'll be happier with the ones they make. Well, that's really an interesting point. Now, we've talked a little bit about the brain science, a little bit about the marketing issue. There's also a whole cultural influence right. that you discuss in the book. And I was really interested in your discussion of cultural issues surrounding um, Muslim women right. and their use of a headscarf or a burqa. I know this has been an issue that's come up repeatedly in the news. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that cultural choice? Right. Obviously, this is a, something that's controversial and difficult mm -hmm. to talk about. Uh, and, and the first thing to know is that culture is a, an influence on all of us. And, and I have a chapter in the book saying that, and the, the point of which is that culture is one of these limitations that, it, that we often don't see. I compare it to water to a fish, right? right. It's, it's the, there's an old saying, uh, I don't know who discovered water, but it probably wasn't a fish. Uh, because it, it surrounds us, right? You right. don't notice it. And, and you, you and I have cultural influences mm -hmm. on our way of dress and our, and our way, way of being in the world. Um, I talk some about my mother growing up, again, in, mm -hmm. uh, in a small town in Kentucky. She was a school teacher, and uh, at, the, at the time when she was a school teacher back in the 70s in, in Kentucky, the, school teach the women who taught school were not allowed to wear pants. I remember that discussion, uh, yes. So they had to petition the, the Board of Education to allow them to wear pants. So looking back, right, we can mm -hmm. see that that was uh, a limitation on her choice that was a cultural norm that really limited mm -hmm. her ability to dress how she wanted. So now we, instead of looking backward, if we look sort of horizontally to other cultures and including our own, knowing, also keeping in mind some, uh, some skepticism of our own culture and our own cultural situation. I, I, I've been wondering about the burqa. Now the burqa is the full body covering that's only the, yes. that allows the, the, mm -hmm. the screen for the eyes. It's been banned in France. That's right, France was Right, the it was the Asian first European right. country mm -hmm. to ban it. Belgium has also banned it, I believe, in public places. And, but there's no conversation about that in the United States at all, even though uh, the, the number of women wearing the burqa in the United States is growing. And I think we're not talking about it in the United States because of our fixation on choice. We think, well, the women are choosing to wear the burqa, and in America we, we respect choice. That's one thing we know. We respect people's choice. And all I want us to think about is that maybe that those choices aren't any more genuine than the choices that my mother made to wear a dress back in the 1970s uh, Kentucky. They're culturally coerced, even if not legally coerced. And if that's true, at least for a, a, a number of women who are wearing a burqa, mm -hmm. then maybe we shouldn't defer to that choice as often, especially when there's other public policy principles or ideals that we need to weigh against that choice. Now, again, I say this with some, some understanding that this is a complicated and controversial idea. But I don't think we simply need to create a presumption that we, that we defer to every individual's choice in every situation, because that choice may be a product of coercion rather than free will. True. And to segue into another part of the book, you discuss an incident 
dealing with an individual's perception of authority right. and the role of authority. And the incident I'm thinking of is the um, famous sweat lodge incident right. involving James Arthur Ray. And I wonder if you could talk about how that perception of authority and influence of authority led to the really fatal outcome of that it was um, It was horrible. This was a, a, a chapter I was writing about the power of authority. You know, I, I, I break up in the book the number of different limitations on our free will. I talk about our biology. I talk about culture. I talk about economics. I talk about uh, the power of authority. And as I was writing this chapter, I was focusing mostly on Stanley Milgram's old experiments back in the 60s. Right. Uh, they're famous. They, they, you know, he brought people in to help the, under the guise of saying, well, you're going to help me experiment on how people learn, and when uh, you're going to be the teacher, and, and as the learner makes mistakes, you're supposed to shock them. And he learned that uh, over 60 percent of, of his, his, his subjects were actually willing to shock uh, another person, a stranger, up to the point where they thought they were d giving a lethal shock. And as I was writing this chapter, uh, an, the news broke about the fatal sweat lodge incident in Arizona. And what was happening was that this self-help guru named James Arthur Ray uh, invited people to his, to his retreat center in Arizona uh, and, and gone through a number of, 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 uh, of procedures and experiments and uh, uh, to help people take control of their lives and to take to use his words. Yes. And the culmination of it was that they would they would go and spend 36 hours in in the desert with no food or water, and then come back to the retreat center and get in a, a sweat lodge modeled after Native American sweat lodges. Um, at a use in some religious ceremonies and, and, and um, among some Native American tribes uh, and essentially sweat out the impurities of their lives. They would bring in uh, uh, hot rocks into the middle of the, of the sweat lodge. They would uh, keep the doors shut and so it'd get really, it got really, really hot, uh, insufferably hot inside the sweat lodge. And James Arthur Ray sat inside the tent flap and anybody who tried to leave uh, would have to go through his the gauntlet really right. of his authority. And as I, I was writing about Milgram, I, I realized that really what was happening in the sweat lodge was the same thing. People were listening to a person in authority, except in this si situation they weren't willing to shock a stranger. They were sure. willing to harm themselves. Their own selves, yes. And as it turned out, three people died in the sweat lodge that night that day because they were more willing to suffer uh, what turned out to be a, a, a mortal injury instead of facing his criticism, his belittlement as they tried to leave the sweat lodge to reach the safety of the fresh air. Right. So the point here is that we, don't under, we often don't recognize how susceptible we are to authority. Uh, and I think it may be an evolutionary concern that we uh, that we listen to authority, and of course, as parents, we know right. that it's we want our kids to listen to authority. We yes. they want they want we want them to listen to us, and so the key part, like in so many of, of the things that I realized, was that we've got to develop the capacity to dissent, to assert our own authority, uh, to say no when when we're being asked to do something that is morally, ethical, ethically, legally wrong. And I think that requires, again, legal changes and policy changes and political changes. One example, again, controversial. I think schools, instead of teaching uh, uh, rote patriotism, they ought to be more open to teaching kids how to dissent. So I think it's a mistake to start every school day with a Pledge of Allegiance. I think it teaches people to be obedient and teaches people to be uh, unthinkingly patriotic, when instead we ought to be teaching students how to, to question, how to make their own minds up, how, how to, uh, to, to assert their own authority and to make up their, choose their own behavior based on their own principles. That's a wonderful way to end our discussion today. I really enjoyed discussing the book with you. Thank you. And I hope that you'll have wonderful success with it and Thanks. that it will meet a really large market. Thanks. Thank you.